Hello everybody, I am Joey Famelli, a video producer here for Tested.com, and today I'm going to go through a behind the scenes look on a video camera we've been using recently, the uh, Blackmagic Micro Cinema Camera. So some of you may have noticed we have a couple unique angles in our time lapses for the uh, Totoro one day build video that I posted recently. Uh, and that is because we're able to get this guy shoved in spots that we normally couldn't get to in Adam's shop and lock off these nice little time lapses from uh, unique perspectives. So I've been testing this guy for a few months now off and on uh, in very specific scenarios. And that is because this camera is a kind of uh, specific specialty camera. Um, it's not a camera that you would rig up for a, a shoulder rig and use a monitor. I mean, you could. You could totally rig this up with monitors and extra batteries and audio gear, but this camera is not really made for that. Uh, you'll notice a couple of things about it. It is small. It's very small. It's a little larger than a GoPro, but it is very small on video camera standards. And uh, it does not have any kind of screen on it, um, which that shares in common with the GoPro's one to four. Don't let that fool you. This camera does not have a whole lot of other things in common with the GoPro. They're both used for action shots, sure, but the GoPro is a set it and forget it kind of camera. It is a, a camera with uh, the color profile already baked in. It's got you know auto exposure, auto shutter, everything kind of sets it for you so you can run through different scenarios and the camera will always look good. This camera is gonna take a little bit more of a planning. It's a cinema camera with interchangeable lens options and a, a RAW and ProRes recording optional workflow. So you're gonna to need to set your shot up the way you want, get the depth of field that you want, grab the focus you want, use a monitor to check all that stuff, hit record and, and go from there. Now, the cinema camera aspect of this is kind of what makes it special. Like I said, it has uh, both RAW and ProRes recording options, meaning you'll get a very flat profile with lots of data. It uses a super 16 size sensor. There's uh, 13 stops of dynamic range. It uses a micro four thirds mount. So you can either use your Micro Four Thirds glass or you can adapt it to a, a number of different uh, lens styles. So we use a, a Metabones Micro Four Thirds, a Canon EF uh, adapter for that and use all of our Canon glass and it's great. Uh, so some of you may actually know that I am a fan of this Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. This camera came out a few years ago and uh, I've been playing around with it a lot since then. Uh, we've rigged it up as a shoulder camera, as a main camera, or I've used it uh, as like a secondary cam, like a B camera. Uh, I'm always bringing it with me when I travel just because it's so small and portable and I can grab some nice shots when we're on location in places that we can't bring a whole camera out. And for that, I often use these Panasonic uh, Lumix lenses with the optical image stabilization because essentially you're just you're holding a sensor and you're going to get a lot of shake and jitter if you're not careful. And that stabilization just helps give you a little bit of a smoother and cleaner image. So from there, the workflow is usually bring into DaVinci Resolve or some other color grading program or you can just take it into Premiere and grade it there. From that, you're going to get that flat image. Uh, but with all that data in there, you can you can mess with the curves, you can adjust the contrast, uh, bring the colors out, change the colors. You can really do a lot uh, once you once you have access to all that data in that flat image. Learning Dissolve and learning how to use that and it's art all of its own, and it's it's a lot of fun to work with if you if you have the time to do it. But if you want something that, like I said, you can just set it and forget it. This isn't the camera for you. This camera is going to require post production work, and uh, if that's something you're into then these cameras will be fun for you and they'll be a, a great little learning tool for how images capture data, essentially. So let's go back to this micro cinema camera. Since it doesn't have any monitor on it, I use this guy. This is a small HD monitor, goes in through HDMI. I just use a little arm that connects onto it and I can actually load my color profiles into this monitor so I can see essentially what uh, my finished image will look closer to. Instead of, instead of looking at that flat image, I can look at a, uh, an image that has been color corrected somewhat for the monitor purposes that I can uh, get an idea of what I'm, what I'm shooting. Um, it uses these Canon LPE6 batteries, which is a huge improvement from the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera batteries, which last about 20 minutes per battery, which is not great at all. I would travel with about four of them and get an okay day of shooting. With these guys, I've used them for up to an hour, an hour and a half, and they've been uh, just a huge improvement. They're very common I mean, chargers. People use them for uh, DSLRs all the time, so it's it's a much more accessible battery with a much longer life, which is uh, fantastic. So let's go to what I've been using this camera for. I've probably used this in three different environments. Uh, one was on the generator trip when we went to the Arctic. I brought this guy with me to test it out there to see how it did in the cold. We had another shoot where we were uh, in the Mojave Desert and I had it locked off onto cars as dash cameras. Uh, and the last was I actually rigged it up um, for usage as like a, like a main camera we're in Budapest and I was just grabbing uh, shots of the, of the city and, and essentially B-roll. Now, 
well, let's start with the Arctic. So the Arctic, I had a Sony FS5, which I'm shooting with now here. That was my main camera, but this camera I would keep in one pocket and I'd keep batteries and the monitor in another pocket. And what I would do is I would clamp it onto the side of rails uh, when we were doing anything interesting on the ship. And I would grab time lapses of like helicopter rides taking off or you know guys in boats going around. And I would tape these hand warmers on the back of the battery. So what happens with cold is cold drains batteries a little bit quicker. So one tip, since the battery's exposed here, one tip I did was just I took a hand warmer, shook it up so it activated, taped it onto the back and then actually extended the battery life because the cold actually dropped this camera's battery down to about 40, 45 minutes um, with the hand warmer. Without the hand warmer, I was lasting about 20 minutes. So that hand warmer helped, but it probably could have even been warmer to last me a little longer. Now, uh, the Arctic was where that 13 stops of dynamic range really came in handy because we're dealing with a very, very white snow, very blue skies, harsh shadows, um, you know, we had lots of sun and keeping this guy set to film mode to take advantage of that, of that dynamic range was crucial because I had, like I said, I had all that data. Even though the image was flat, I still had all that data in the blacks and I still had all that data in the whites. So when I took it into post-production in DaVinci, I can adjust those curves and, and bring out the entire image together while keeping everything relatively uh, within the legal limits, so to speak, with everything, the blacks not clipping, the whites not clipping. The major flaw that I found with this camera, uh, is, and which was uh, made even more apparent on the Arctic trip with gloves, was this, these buttons, the button placements and these, these small five buttons that are in front of the camera. Now, you gotta do all your, all your navigating to the menus with these buttons, and they're already kind of in an awkward spot and hard enough to hit normally, but when you're wearing uh, you know, any kind of gloves out in the Arctic, Man, trying to navigate through that menu system was a nightmare. And you know, it's it's hard enough without gloves, super hard with gloves. I don't know what the solution would have been for me, maybe a little joystick or something, uh, but my fingers are just too fat and clumsy to really uh, effectively navigate through these menu systems and click on the buttons that I would need. Uh, most often would just hit, hit my finger on the camera and hopefully the right button would be hit. Uh, so the next shoot that we did was inside vehicles in the desert. And this was probably my favorite use of this camera. Now what we do is we put some grip tape onto the dashboard. We use this stuff called butyl. This is sticky, gummy uh, stuff, essentially, that you just wedge onto the camera and to the dashboard with, the, with the, uh, the, the gaff tape. And it would lock in the camera, just hold it super solid right down the dash. And what we would do is we set up a three camera shoot. We basically do an ISO on the driver, an ISO on the passenger, and a wide on everybody. Uh, and then we just, we have the small HD monitor and we just walk around with an HDMI, jack it in, check your shot, get the focus, adjust the depth of field, uh, adjust the exposure, go to the next one, set all three, and then hit record and, uh, and just start driving. That way we didn't have any camera operators kind of rigging up uh, any kind of poles in the car. We were able to just get, the, get these shots that we needed um, pretty, pretty effectively and pretty inexpensively. The one thing we notice that with these stabilized lenses is that when they're jacked onto the, the dash, uh, the vibrations on it for some reason messes with that stabilization, the mechanical, mechanical bit that's in there, and it would give it this crazy jitter jello effect on the lenses and the image, uh, essentially making the footage unusable. So we took these off and we actually put on some Rokinon Prime 7.5 millimeter lenses. Um, and then with that crop factor of 2.88 that this camera has, it gave us something in the 21 millimeter range that worked really well with those ISO shots in the car. So that was the desert. And then most recently, just a couple weeks ago, I grabbed this kit and I took a tripod and I headed to Budapest for a tested trip that you'll hear more about in the future. Uh, but I had a little bit of spare time to go out into the city and shoot some footage. So what I did is I grabbed an arm, grabbed the HD monitor, I rigged up just basically like a, just a little camera that has a little handle on top that I can walk around and grab shots with and lock shots off. And we're staying over near the chain bridge in, in Budapest, which is uh, one of the first bridges to connect Buda and Pest. And uh, every morning, kind of before sunrise, I'd just go out and grab some shots and, and just take it into town, take it to some farmer's markets and just grab shots of locals just to see how it would handle as a, a main camera. Uh, it, was a fun, it was a fun experiment to do and it, it taught me a lot about this camera. Uh, not something I would do every day. Um, you know, you're still, you're still trying to turn something like this into a main camera that it's just not meant for. Um, this camera is, is really meant for specialty situations, not stuff where you're just trying to run and gun around town. That being said though, like I said, I learned a lot about the camera and about capabilities and being able to mess around with false color and some of the color profiles in the monitor was a lot of fun. In the, in the future, I mean, I would definitely take a main camera, but this is probably gonna be in our mobile kit quite often just because it's so easy just to place anywhere and set time lapses or just you know, grab shots that we need uh, and just put in, in strange areas that we normally couldn't get angles from.
So that's about it for our uses so far. Uh, we had two of these cameras for re review and ended up purchasing one just because I know that it can be uh, totally useful in more of the Adams builds when we do one day builds and grab some nice time lapses and more dash cam stuff. We're gonna be doing more stuff in cars or you know, hopefully more on helicopters. Uh, it's, it is, a, it is a, a perfect tool for the tested arsenal. And there's one more piece of this camera that I have not yet experimented with, and that is this guy, the expansion port, which I think is right up our alley here at Tested. And it's a, uh, this camera comes with a mess of cables. Uh, and those cables can add remote control functionality, uh, or you can map camera functions to joysticks or the controllers, and you can kind of program a number of different things that you wanna try with this. I know people on YouTube have already been making little hand controls, uh, yeah, mapping buttons to, to functionality here. This stuff's being used for people who wanna mount this on DIY drones and wanna have uh, some, some control over their camera. There's tons of stuff that uh, is, is possible to do with this expansion port and I'm essentially just keeping a notebook to the side of little, little experiments that I wanna try with it. So I'll, I'll document more of that and if I do something cool then I can share it with you guys. But uh, I'm really excited to, to, to really dive into that uh, expansion port on this. So that's about it. That is the Blackmagic Micro Cinema camera that we've been playing around with. Uh, see if you can spot it in the one day build Totoro video. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. I know it's a lot of production gear and codec talk and raw and ProRes. So hopefully that all made sense. If you have any questions, throw them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. But uh, thank you guys for coming on this behind the scenes look. And we will see you guys next time. Bye.